Kate here and I'm going to attempt to collect my thoughts and review uh, Elizabeth Gaskell, A Habit of Stories by Jenny Uglo. This was just such a marvelous, marvelous reading experience for me. I gave this five stars. Um, nonfiction, you know, I'm trying to read more, but I can get intimidated. But I think if you just pick a subject matter you are very interested in, and it also helps that Jenny Uglo's writing was very, um, uh, it just, it felt very story-like, just telling you um, the story of her life. And um, I think A Habit of Stories is very appropriate, just learning about this marvelous woman. And it's just so wonderful, you know, to have a beloved author. And then after reading a biography of them, you love them even more. And I don't know how many authors I would say that about, you know, how many authors knowing about their personal lives, I would feel like I liked them more. Um, but I learned um, so many interesting things and just more interesting things about her life and putting together more of a picture of who she was. So it's just been really fun to delve into knowing more about her life, reading the letters um, of her, and then now reading this biography. It's just been really, really um, captivating. So one thing already going in that I did not know was that I thought she had, um, well, I knew she had four daughters and she had lost a son, but I did not realize until reading this, actually her first child was a stillborn. Um, and I don't think they even named her necessarily. So that was really sad to me just thinking about, I think when you think back into the past more, um, there are, uh, just so many people, so many parents who lost children. And I just cannot imagine living with the weight of that grief. Um, and for it to be so common and for there to be so many parents that lost more than one child, it's just so heartbreaking. Um, and so it actually was interesting that um, she, after losing her son, who the son was about a year old and then he got sick and he died and it's just so heartbreaking. Her husband actually encouraged her to start writing. She had been writing little kind of um, maybe essays and a couple short stories here and there, but he told her, why don't you sit down and write a book? You're so good at telling stories. Um, and I loved learning from this that they did uh, have a very um, but much a partnership in their marriage. Um, he considered her, you know, not just as um, this kind of, uh, what do I want to say, like a figure piece to have in the household, but as someone with intellect and um, someone with passions. And so seeing their partnership that they had, it was really interesting to see that as a Victorian marriage. And so um, it was just very, very interesting. Um, so I have put tabs kind of where I thought things were interesting. Um, the one one note that I will say about this, though, is Jenny Uglo herself, you can tell very much from the writing um, that she herself is not a person of faith. So I think some things are a little bit lost on her about Elizabeth Gaskell's life. There is speculation that at some point Elizabeth Gaskell was in love with um, someone else, Char Charles Eliot Norton, um, and he was a writer um, from America and they met when she was on a trip in Italy and I've seen people say like well you know if it were not for the conventions of the day in the Victorian age you know she probably would have left her husband but I think that's really not understanding no actually it's just a conviction that she had you know for the sanctity of marriage um and I don't know that I buy necessarily that she was even in love with this man I think they had more of a mother-son relationship but just kind of this like she was so repressed and so that's the only reason whereas I think she had genuine convictions and she was standing by them and also she did really have a friendship with her husband um and so one of the first sentences that I noticed was Jenny Uglo says that um both her parents were Unitarians and this faith um a way of thinking and an attitude to life as much as a set of beliefs and I think that's what um, I hear many secular authors say, you know, oh, oh, it's not just a set of beliefs. This kind of like, um, kind of shocks them that, you know, it's not just a set of beliefs, but when you are a person of faith, that is it's your whole reason for being there's, um, you see so much of that throughout the day and you think about everything through that lens. And so, you know, I'll hear 
kind of passing comments about books. Well, there there were religious elements in this, but blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, when it's just the values that this author has coming through, a religious author coming through, you know, they're going to have those values that you see. But when a secular author puts their values through, I don't say when I read a book, well, there were secular elements in this. Um, so I just think it's an interesting kind of commentary that I hear uh, now and again um, on BookTube about books like, well, it had religious elements, but you don't hear like the religious booktubers going, well, it had secular elements. Um, but one thing that was really sad to me at the very beginning was that she was not wanted by her stepmother. Her mother died when she was very little and then her father remarried and they had another child and her stepmother like made it very clear. She was not interested in Elizabeth living with them. And that made, that just broke my heart. But the one thing that makes it okay is that the book Cranford, which is based on the village of Nutford, is where Elizabeth was sent to live with some older aunts. And she was very loved while she was there. So although I think she still had, when she was older, kind of this thing of this rejection by her stepmother and therefore her father being okay with her being sent away, she did still have plenty of love. And I think she was a, you know, a well-adjusted adult. Um, but I thought that was, that's just really a sad thing. You know, you're this vulnerable little girl, your mother has died and then your stepmother doesn't even want you to live there. So it just sounded very traumatic. Um, I love this quote from Henry James about her writing. Um, he says, the variety of her fiction has often baffled those who wish to pigeonhole her neatly. Social comedy, protest novel, domestic drama. Such labels sacrifice her richness and complexity to false gods of order and unity. Each of herselves at various times found its own voice and form. And sometimes the voices blend or clash within a single work. And I love, there's really like not a lot of sameness in her books. Her books each feel very distinct. And that's something that I like about her. So she was raised um, Unitarian and then meets William Gaskell through some connections and they had a really sweet courtship and he was genuinely kind of swept away by her and she was known for being very witty very clever um and also just having so much social grace about her and so she was um this very uh just made other people feel when they were interacting with her like they were a very important person and she was very um, she just made people feel special. She made them feel special. So I think she really charmed him. And they lived in Manchester, which she really was not thrilled about. Kind of for the for most of her adult life, she was not that thrilled to be living in Manchester. There was lots of pollution. It was very, very cold, very crowded. And it was her first time kind of living up close and personal with severe poverty. Um, and just very, very jarring. I think when you've lived in this kind of um, secluded existence in a nice little village and not seeing that. And so moving to Manchester, I think was a real culture shock for her. And um, there was one quote that just really, um, uh, it, oh, it just got to me. So it was, um, there were strikes going on in Manchester and she was visiting different families, kind of bringing food and other supplies to them. And she was kind of trying to be a mediator between the masters and the men, as it's called in North and South, um, and saying, you know, well, don't you think, you know, kind of saying things in favor of them. And a poor uh, mill worker said to her, yes, but, you know, have they ever had their child clem to death? And clem means starve. And so he's saying, have they ever had to watch their child starve to death? And that just, oh, it got to me so much. So she really was, um, you know, very up close and personal seeing what it was like for people to experience extreme poverty. Um, and just uh, had, she was very much like Unitarians are very much known for social justice. And so she was really living by that and interested in social reform and um, just very much interested in kind of, making things better in society, figuring out how that could happen. Um, so Mary Barton definitely addressed some of that. It's very much more heavily em emphasized on the working men and on their experience in that. And there was a quote on this page. What does it say? 
uh, that Elizabeth Gaskell said, art is the nearest thing to life. It is a mode of amplifying experience and extending our contact with our fellow men beyond the bounds of our personal lot. All the more sacred is the task of the artist when he undertakes to paint the life of the people. Falsification here is more pernicious than in the more artificial aspects of life. So she, I think, really viewed the novel as a way that you could show different um, convictions that you had and show it in a way that really spoke to people, not just giving statistics and data, but showing this is what this experience is like as being a mill worker. Um, and it really outraged, Mary Barton outraged a lot of people and, uh, you know, mostly the masters <laughs> because they thought it was portrayed really unfairly. And I don't think it was really portrayed unfairly, um, but it was interesting to see just with her first book, she made a lot of waves. And then comes Ruth <laughs> and Ruth in involves a fallen woman. And so what I think is so awkward is, you know, her husband is a Unitarian clergyman. And so she's going to church every Sunday. And apparently there were people at the church that refused to talk to her after Ruth was published. How awkward is that? You're like going to church, you're just gonna like visit with your friends and there are certain people at church who aren't talking to you because of your book that you publish. So I, I just can't imagine. It sounds so awkward. Um, let's see. Oh, I love this passage about just what a storyteller she was. It says, um, from time to time after Mary Barton was published, Elizabeth would proclaim to the world at large that she was not working on another book. The fact was, however, that she simply could not cease writing. Stories were intrinsic to her cast of mind. Her letters are studded with swift character sketches and condensed narratives. Some flash past in a few suggestive phrases, like the placing of the yet unknown Charlotte Frude as a heroine of romance, or this description of a local murder in 1850. Such a tragedy here yesterday, which you will see in the papers. We knew Mrs. Novelli. She was a Ma Madonna-like person with a face and character, I believe, full of thought and gentle love. Miss Maystade's faithful servant and friend. Other letters are instinctively composed to produce an effect, like the long description of giving Tennyson's poems to Bamford with its structure of quest, discovery, climax, and final tableau. She told Forster of her great joy in hunting across Manchester for the great gray stalwart man, pouncing on him as he emerged from a pub and leaving him red with pleasure, reading aloud in the middle of the street in a sleepwalking state, in grave danger she feared of being run over." And I just really got that from the letters that I read. And I think even that bit about her finding the book for Bamford was one of the passages that I read out when I did my review of her letters. Um, and she also had a friendship with a fair number of famous authors. She, um, Geraldine Jewsbury, who's the writer of The Half Sisters and Zoe that I've read, um, really liked Elizabeth Gaskell. Elizabeth Gaskell, however, apparently did not really like her. I think she just found her personality really grating and jarring. And um, I think she was a little bit too, Geraldine Jewsbury was a bit too bohemian for Elizabeth Gaskell. So I, I found that interesting, but also she loved George Eliot's writing. She had such an admiration for George Eliot and um, was so excited. She got the mill on the floss on the, like the day after it was published and was so excited to have it. Uh, it makes me so sad though, that she died before Daniel Deronda or Middlemarch. So she didn't get to read either of those. Um, but also she was friends with Charlotte Bronte. And I love in a letter to Elizabeth Gaskell, Charlotte Bronte says, in one letter, Charlotte asked, could you manage to convey a small kiss to that dear but dangerous little person, Julia? She has surreptitiously possessed herself of a minute fraction of my heart, which has been missing ever since I saw her. And I love that so much. So sweet. So yes, she had four daughters. She had um, Mary Ann and she had Flora, who was also called Flossie. And um, Margaret, who was called Mita, which I've never heard as a nickname for Margaret. I thought that was so interesting. Um, and... Uh, she, it's really special to see. She was very, very fond of her daughters and it was very common for her, like while they were getting piano lessons to be writing in the other room, um, hearing things going on. But there was this constant struggle in her life of kind of trying to balance the, the busyness of life of kind of keeping up with her social calendar and then going back to her writing and just having alone time. She just longed for that respite of being alone by herself. Um, and at one point she like sent off her husband, William, who I think was ill and wanted him to go, um, 
you know, kind of recuperate on his own and sent off her daughters to be with someone and said she was going to travel, like told all her friends she was going to travel just so she could stay at home and write on her own. And I, I love that so much. Um, and then she always longed to be kind of out of Manchester. She considered Manchester to like, she just was not able to truly rest there. Um, so she did go back to Knutsford periodically, you know, where her childhood was. And she says, I am so much better for Knutsford, partly air, partly quiet, and partly being by myself, a good piece of every day, which I am so sure, so essential, which I am sure so essential to my health that I'm going to persevere to enforce it here. So there is this kind of pattern of her just really trying to be just by herself, just be alone and it really being a struggle and an uphill battle to get that alone time. This comment that Jenny Uglo makes about Cranford, I love. It says, Cranford is a rich and rewarding book, yet its richness is very subtle and its comedy so delicate that it can seem to repudiate analysis as too heavy, a violation of its mood. It is a very low key book. It's very low key. And I think you can kind of miss the brilliance of it if you hurry through it. And um, yes. So actually what's interesting is that she was planning on writing Ruth and then got sidetracked by writing Cranford. She just kind of felt like thinking about her childhood and a lot of the things that are in it are in Cranford are things that really happened. And then there were things that she didn't include um, like um, apparently there was a person who regularly had set like a group of dogs, I think like five or six dogs, and they would dress up the dogs in fancy clothing and take them for carriage drives. <laughs> and then this is included in the Cranford miniseries, even though it's not in um, Cranford the book. But this, uh, these sisters got an old, uh, they got a rug, but they didn't want the sun to um, kind of the sun to fade the rug and they just wanted it to stay nice. And so the maid, when she was serving tea, tried to hop around, like carrying the tea tray and hop around in all the shaded portions of the rug. That just made me laugh so much. Um, let's see, what do I have marked next? Uh, another quote about her fiction. It says, the richness of Gaskell's fiction derives from the very fullness of the daily life, which constricted her writing time. She moved in a world where personal contacts and the flow of ideas were so interconnected that the idea of the web will not do, unless one thinks of an autumn hedgerow where web after web glistens in the sun, each so intricately linked to the other that the slightest touch sets them all in motion. A better image is that of overlapping circles drawn by a compass whose point is fixed in a central circle of Elizabeth's family, marriage, and faith. Family relationships shade into a wider Unitarian circle, and this in turn overlaps with others, philanthropic, political, literary, scientific, which embrace people of different religious affiliations, Anglican, Evangelical, Quaker, Christian Socialist, Agnostic. Such rings then touch and connect with others, with circles of theologians, writers, and radical refugees from Europe, with American transcendentalists, feminists, and abolitionists. Um, so she had such a varied um, group of people that she knew that she came into contact with. And um, I just find it so cool to hear about all the connections that she made. Um, and then it was talking about some of the reviews for Ruth and some of them, you know, it was such a mixed bag what people thought of it. It says, the respectable condemned her immorality, the liberal praised her courage, the radical regretted her feebleness. On balance, however, praise was loudest. And Ruth raised Gaskell's reputation to new heights, but it took her a long time to see this. So I think she really took the criticisms that came out about it to heart and um, eventually saw there were a fair number of people who enjoyed it. Um, and eventually at one point she went to visit Charlotte Bronte and um, she says, everything combined to complete the picture. We battled against the wind on Penistone Moor where the sinuous hills seemed to girdle the world like the great Norse serpent. Um, so her visit to Charlotte really made an impression on her. And um, she, yes, it just, it made such an impression on her. And um, she just had just a very dear and cherished friendship with Charlotte. Um, so then later on events, which I will get to, make me really sad, the turn of events that happened. Um, let's see here. Oh, yes. Okay. Now, you know who I didn't feel more fond of by the end of this is Charles Dickens. I mean, listen, 
I like the man's books, but the more I learn about his personal life, the more I dislike him. And I love when Louisa May Alcott got to hear him do a reading um, in London. She said he was foppish. She was like very disappointed. He just seemed like very like prissy to her. Um, uh, so she published in his, she serialized North and South in his um, literary like publication, Household Words. And after she did that, she said never again would she publish something in Household Words. He was so difficult to work with and he would not get off her case about the length of North and South. North and South it is close to maybe 500 pages. So I, I'm like, Dickens, I'm sorry. Like, have you read your books? Have you read your books? I That really like... I could not believe to hear that, that he was upset about the length of North and South. Unbelievable. 500 pages would be a short book by him. Um, and in addition to that, he stole a story idea from her. She heard of some event that happened, something remarkable. It might have been a murder case. And she told him, oh, my goodness, like I heard about this and I'm going to write a story about it. And then before she could do it, he had published it in Household Words. So. I was already, you know, like I said, I like reading his books. I don't like knowing about him. Um, so then Charlotte Bronte passes away. And there are all sorts of stories being published, all sorts of falsehoods being published about Charlotte in the newspapers. And her father, Charlotte's father and Charlotte's husband were like, enough is enough. We need to have someone kind of defend her and... Um, you know, put out the truth. And so they hired Elizabeth Gaskell to do this biography. And I get frustrated when I hear this biography talked about because I think a lot of the times when people are so critical of the life of Charlotte Bronte, the book written by Elizabeth Gaskell, they aren't putting it in context. And so biography, like the biography was such a new thing. And in addition to that, you know, I, I hear from Bronte um, devotees that are very unhappy with this book. Um, Ellen Nussie, Charlotte's best friend in the entire world, approved of this. She got to see the final copy and she was happy with it when it came out. Um, and Charlotte's father, he says, and I quote, you have not only given a picture of my dear daughter, Charlotte, but of my dear wife and all my dear children and such a picture too, as is full of truth and life. The picture of my brilliant and unhappy son and his diabolical seducer are masterpieces. So even her father was happy with it. And so I think sometimes when I hear people talk about it nowadays with their, you know, the critiques that they have make it sound like she was going out of her way to slander Charlotte Bronte. And that was, she was trying to do right by her. And so um, when this made such waves and people were threatening to sue her for libel, she said that she had never cried so much in her life as she cried after all of the waves about this biography. So the critiques that people have nowadays for it um, are very different than the waves that it made when it was first published. The reason people were very upset when it was first published were the people that were specifically mentioned. So Lowood School from Jane Eyre, you know, is based on a real school where the treatment of children was horrible and Elizabeth Gaskell just put it out there. You know, this place is awful. The conditions uh, for children to live in are awful. And so some people from the school sued her. And then people that had written negative re reviews of Charlotte's books are kind of mentioned in this. And so it made a lot of waves. Um, so I really think Elizabeth Gaskell was trying to do right by her. The biography was a very new thing. Um, and someone says, in my opinion, and the reading world's opinion of the memoir is that it is in every way worthy of what one great woman should have written of another. So I think that's a very good point. You know, she's writing about a friend. And so I think I think people are a little too hard on Elizabeth Gaskell about it. Um, I am going on too long. There's just so much to say about it. I was very excited to get to the parts about Sylvia's lovers because she was inspired after she visited uh, Whitby. Um, and it's just such a, I mean, look up pictures of Whitby. It just demands for stories to be set there. Uh, so I was just very, very excited to hear that. Um, then I did like this passage where she was talking about her husband and she says, 
Oh, how I shall envy Mr. Gaskell if he does reach you. He is going to visit someone. I feel so sure you will like each other. He is very shy, but very merry when he is well, delights in puns and punning, and is very fond of children, playing with them all the day long, not caring for them so much when they are grown up. Used to speak Italian pretty well, but says he can't now. Six foot high, gray hair and whiskers, and otherwise very like Marianne in looks. You'll think him stiff till his shyness wears off, and I am sure it will directly with you. Uh, so I loved hearing that, that he liked puns. That's something that I think a love of puns has been around for a long time. Um, at points, Jenny Ulo compares Sylvia's lovers to The Mill on the Floss. I did not like The Mill on the Floss when I first read it, but I was already considering rereading it because George Eliot is a favorite now. And so hearing that too, hearing it compared to that makes me want to try it again. Um, and then comes Wives and Daughters. Wives and Daughters, her last and final novel that ended up being unfinished. And it was so heartbreaking to me to read this because she was trying so hard to finish it. Um, now she didn't know she was going to be dying while writing this, obviously. <laughs> no one knows when they're going to die, but I mean specifically like she felt better than she had in years. And one of the things is that she had this project of buying a house um, away from Manchester. <laughs> buying a house actually, um, from where Jane Austen was from. I think that's what they said. Um, so far, far from Manchester. And she hadn't told her husband about it. It was going to be a surprise. And so it was years in the making getting this house together. And she goes, um, she goes to visit the house. And it was at this house that she died. Uh, but it talks about her writing Wives and Daughters. It says, although its course did not run smooth, her story swept her joyously back to the past and to the country away from Manchester. Um, so I think many people, for the reasons that they love Jane Austen, just would love Wives and Daughters. And um, it's just very, uh, very uh, much kind of in the in the vein of Jane Austen's books. And um, without villains, murders, bigamies, or adulteries, Gaskell's novel, just as much as Mary Braddon's Lady Audley's Secret, shows how fatal lies and silences can be. And she just does it with such skill. Um, Real understanding requires context as well as content. Wives and Daughters is rich in both a study of the delicate yet powerful interplay of nature and nurture and of the combined pressure of class and culture. These strands are woven into a densely patterned tapestry. Um, and to be rereading Wives and Daughters now and hear that just makes me so happy. And um, it's just such an amazing book. You know, you've heard me talk about it. And an interesting thing I found also was Gaskell called her own Marianne both Molly and Cynthia. They are halves of a whole. And that really puts an interesting spin on the characters of Molly and Cynthia, kind of being halves of a whole. Um, really made me think about it. Um, yes, yeah, so she died um, mid-sentence. And she was talking about her friend Lady Crompton and how she wanted her to have a treat. And she says, I want Lady Crompton to have something pleasant to look forward to after I'm gone. She can go to Rome when. And then um, she had uh, she fell forward with a slight gasp and she passed away. And I, I teared up then because that's just so, I mean, I knew it was coming, but I still wasn't prepared for it. Um, she was just such a marvelous, marvelous woman. And so it's lovely to read these books that I love so much and then to find out that I just love the author even more reading about it. So it is definitely, definitely a dream someday to visit her house. Um, who knows when uh, Travel Abroad will be back, but someday, you know, I can always dream. So I hope you enjoyed my very meandering thoughts. I always struggle with, I either feel like I do like six minute book reviews or 30 minute book reviews. <laughs> I don't really know how to do them in between. So. I will leave it at that and I hope you enjoyed. Let me know if you have read this or just what thoughts you have in general and I will be back for another video soon. Bye.